Good evening and assalamu alaikum. Welcome everyone that is joining us and hopefully all those who are joining us on uh, Facebook and uh, social media. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to this uh, conversation. It's not that often that you immediately get a book uh, and an author that you uh, really get um, attracted to both the title as well as the content. Uh, it's my really my uh, honor and privilege to have with me today Professor uh, Sunaira, Sunaira Thobani. Uh, she's a professor in the Department of uh, Asian Studies at the University of British Columbia. For those who don't know, British Columbia is to the north of us. I know that geography has often been a major challenge for people, but British Columbia is on the western part of Canada. Uh, she has been a major contributor to uh, works in uh, critical race theory, post-colonial, transnational, and feminist theory, South Asian women's gender and sexuality studies, uh, representation of Islam and Muslims in South Asian and Western media. And uh, she presented for us at the International Islamophobia Conference, where uh, we have uh, come to know each other. And uh, today, again, I am so happy that I am actually holding the book in my hand. Uh, and uh, welcome to Naira for, for this conversation. And it's really a pleasure to have you with us. We can hear you. Sorry, I still forget. <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you for the introduction. And I would like to thank you for organizing this session and also for all of the people who've been involved in publicizing it, in organizing the technology around it. Thank you very much. I'm very grateful to all of you. Uh, thank you. Uh, now, I always say that uh, Muslims are often studied, but we still don't know much about them as a people because they're spoken about, but not really engaged or discussed in a, uh, in a complete uh, way. And uh, we have many parachute experts. We have what I call uh, pilots who just jump in and all of a sudden they're introduced in uh, media circles as one well as experts. And in here for me, I first would like to recommend for everybody to pick the book. Uh, I have included in the chat a link and I know that the paperback will come out uh, June on 2022, but you still can access the hard copy as well as um, if you want to have, uh, you know, to read it online, you're able to do so. Uh, so let's jump out on the conversation. At uh, first, I always am attracted to the titles of books. Uh, why is the title and how did you arrive uh, to this particular title? And that brings the three things together, Islam, race, and sexuality, which again is mostly uh, will be the thesis of the book, but the title itself, how did you arrive to it? Um, right, well, before I get to the title, I will just acknowledge that I am on indigenous, indigenous lands here. I'm on Musqueam territory, and I just would like to remind uh, people who are present here that indigenous peoples are engaged in struggles for sovereignty over this land. And it behooves us to you know, learn more about the struggles of indigenous peoples and also to build solidarity with them. Um, so the title of the book, it's an it's a interesting story. Um, I didn't get the title I wanted. Mm. Uh, you know, the title is usually in the publisher's hand and they will decide on the title. What title did you want? <laughs> I wanted the book to be called Inordinate Desire, mm. Islam in the Racial Sexual Regimes of the West. Mm. That's the title. So Inordinate Desire mm. is a term that I take from Talal Asad. Sure. Now, the book starts with a quote from Malcolm X and Talal Asad. And he has a really interesting kind of way of putting these words together, Inordinate Desire. And he's talking, of course, about the inordinate desire of capitalism, neoliberal globalization, and of the West. Um, so I, I really wanted that as the title. Uh, but, uh, you know, obviously the publishers uh, had different ideas. <laughs> and we worked, we sort of negotiated, and contesting Islam was important for me. Because in a way, you know, there's a kind of double meaning to that, you know, it's the West contesting Islam. Uh, so I wanted to highlight that. 
And then also Islam as a kind of contestation of this inordinate desire. Uh, so, so, you know, contesting Islam for me was important for those two reasons. And then um, constructing race and sexuality. And by that, I wanted to draw attention to the relationship between kind of, you know, the West contesting Islam and constructing race and sexuality in the process of contesting Islam. So, you know, a bit of a convoluted kind of idea in that first part, the title. And then of course, the second part, I got what I wanted, which was the inordinate desire of the West. So I wanted to, you know, not focus only on Islam in the title, but I really wanted to tie how Islam has been uh, depicted, how it is constructed in the popular imaginary as a kind of project of the West. So I really wanted you know, that relationship to be uh, evident in the title. Uh, you mentioned in your uh, introduction about that both Islam uh, and race are constitutive and almost independent variables in the West. And uh, maybe if you could expand on how you see those as being two independent uh, variables in the constitution of the West. Right. So, you know, Islam is generally put in the category of religion. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, I became really interested because what we saw after 9-11 was that, you know, Muslims were targeted for attacks. But other communities who quote unquote look like Muslims were also being attacked. Mm. And so it was basically black and brown bodies that were being attacked in uh, the kind of immediate aftermath of 9-11. So it was, you know, it became very clear to me that Muslims were being racialized in a particular kind of way. And so the category Muslim didn't signify religion only, but also race. And so that kind of got me really interested in thinking about race and religion on the same analytic plane, rather than separating them off. And try and figure out what are the racial politics of Islamophobia? And then what are the religious politics of how Muslims are being depicted here? And then, you know, so that got me uh, interested in looking at race and religion has been mutually constitutive in the global war on terror. But I wanted to figure out what are the historical uh, precedents? Have, has this happened before? Is this a new moment? How do we understand these racial politics, which are so fused with religion now? Because Islam itself has become racialized in the Western imagination. So, you know, then I kind of walk back to colonialism and of course the Orientalist discourse is a discourse of race. And, you know, Islam is being kind of, is very clearly part of this Orient. And so thinking through the colonial politics around race, because obviously mm -hmm. colonialism was a crucial moment when race gets institutionalized globally within a kind of global hierarchy of race with whiteness at the top. Uh, so I started to then kind of interrogate Orientalism and why, you know, Orientalism, I think Said kind of was obviously very aware of race, but race is not central to his work in thinking about Orientalism. And having been trained in critical race theory, mm -hmm to me that you can't think about colonialism or quote unquote the Orient without looking at the race politics. So Orientalism is also a racial construct. And so I kind of started tracking this relationship back and back to the Crusades. Mm. And clearly the depictions of Muslims that one finds in Christian statements of that period are deeply embedded with racial constructs, race thinking, as well as you know what would later come to be defined as religion. And so for me, you know, going right back to this moment of you know, the Crusades, which obviously is very, very crucial to the production mm -hmm. of the West, what eventually gets produced as the West, and seeing how clearly evident race is and race thinking is in the construction of Muslims. 
so for me, uh, you know, I really wanted to think through race and religion as mutually constitutive. And also a lot of the kind of uh, uh, um, uh, critical race studies in the area of philosophy mm. has looked at how race, uh, you know, um, is not just a category of modernity. Race exists, race thinking exists in pre-modernity, although not in the same language, not in the same terms that it does in modernity. Um, so for me, you know, thinking through and, and finally the argument I make in the book, of course, is that these are mutually constitutive categories, that the concept of religion appears at a particular moment in time when Europe is engaged in the project of colonization. And we have, uh, you know, Hegel has been defined as quite a central figure in the classification of world religions. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and so, you know, with Christianity at the top as the most advanced, the most civilized religion and uh, uh, Islam somewhere at the bottom as a Semitic religion. Mm. And so, uh, you know, Semite is also a category that has a racial meaning. Sure. Well. Um, so, so, you know, the, the kind of scholarship that's been done, which is very exciting oh. in the field of philosophy and religion, is looking at how religion itself was constructed as a category during the colonial period. And that peoples who become colonized, um, you know, come to internalize this category. Of mm. religion, whereas previously, there is so, no such category. So Islam, for example, is deen. How do you go from deen to religion and religion with Christianity as the model of what religion should be and Protestantism as the model of what religion is mm. against which colonized peoples get ranked in terms of their quote unquote religious practices. And so deconstructing the category of religion and seeing that as part of Europe's project of colonizing uh, 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 people around the world and using these categories to classify them, to classify their cultures and to classify religion in this particular hierarchical way, um, uh, you know, kind of uh, um, led me to think through again what the relationship is between colonization, race and religion. Was there any distinctive event or a something that occurred in relation to your work that sprung this uh, book and this research or was this a lifetime engagement that just now crystallizes in this book no 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 it, it's it wasn't a lifetime engagement um you know i i i was kind of uh i was almost led into doing this work if i can use that language you know i was in the women's movement very active in women's organizations yes and uh, um, after the attacks of 9-11, uh, you know, the launching of the global war on terror uh, uh, and the discourse of the global war on terror was very much a racialized Islamophobic discourse. Mm -hmm. The idea that Muslim women needed to be saved, that Muslim men were terrorists, they were violent, you know, Islam was implicated in this violence. Muslim men were constructed as kind of terroristic and part of the kind of, uh, you know, evidence for Muslim men's violence was their mm -hmm. treatment of Muslim women. And so it became an ideological kind of, you know, uh, legitimation for the war on terror, uh, that the war really was about saving Muslim women. So all of us are familiar with that language. It's been written about, um, uh, you know, quite extensively. Uh, so I, I was really uh, um, interested in working with women's organizations uh, to develop an anti-racist, anti-Islamophobic perspective mm -hmm. and not end up supporting the war on terror as a kind of feminist project to save Muslim women. Um, and at that time, I made a speech, uh, you know, uh, at a women's conference on violence against women. Um, and of course, there was all hell to pay because the, the uh, invasion of Afghanistan was just looming. And, uh, you know, I, uh, I was making an argument not only against the war on terror, but against 
the kind of gendering of Islamophobia that was taking place. Mm -hmm. My intention at that time was to mobilize women's organizations to you know, uh, not support the war on terror. Uh, and of course, all hell was let loose and I got a very early taste mm. of the kind of hate stalking that we see today, which has become so common. I received hate messages, death threats, uh, and of course, all of this led me to thinking about the role that the media was playing in uh, mobilizing uh, support, public support for the war on terror, but also constructing Muslims in particular kinds of really destructive ways. So that's how I started this project. But once I started working on it, of course, the questions kept building up, building up, building up. And then eventually it led me to think about how the war on terror was not only setting up Muslims for a form of violence as the governance that they deserved because of, um, you know, having been constructed as terroristic, mm -hmm. but the war on terror was also reconstituting the West itself. Uh, so suddenly, you know, in, in this kind of uh, culture clash, the clash of civilizations, the West was now on the side of women's equality, of uh, you know, uh, the equality of gender and sexual minorities. And so the West was also being redefined through this ideology in relation to Muslim and Islam. Um, and so I became interested in just you know, keeping this relationship in mind as I started uh, taking my research back into earlier historical moments that the way in which Muslims and Islam have been constructed in the Western imaginary is also a story of how the West has constructed itself. Mm. So of course the argument I make is that Islam is a structuring principle of the West itself, of how the West has produced and constructed itself in the Crusades during the Reconquista, during the colonial era, um, you know, uh, in the post-independence period when we see the secularization of Muslim majority countries, that all of these moments at which the West has redefined itself, it has done so at every uh, momentous kind of, uh, uh, you know, period in relation to Islam. And here we are kind of living through the war on terror where the West is also going through a redefinition. And, you know, we see it very clearly in terms of how, um, you know, the construction of uh, Muslim men as hyper misogynist, hyper patriarchal constructs Western men, Western women as, uh, you know, um, equality oriented, right? As, as, uh, as uh, uh, oriented towards the equality of women, uh, even though that's a total myth we know because the violence against women in Western societies is really high as well. Mm -hmm. But yet ideologically, you know, it becomes a part of how people can Westernize themselves through this language of gender sexual egalitarianism. Um, so I like in one place in, in your book when you bring in the Western relations to the Jewish subject in European uh, Western notions and then the Muslim subject. And I thought this conversation bringing these two elements in your work toward how the West constructed itself relative to the Jewish subject and the Muslim subject, if you want to expand on that, because I thought that was like a really a very critical point in your writing. Right. So one thing that has happened in the war on terror is that the West is now defined and defines itself as Judeo-Christian in religious terms, but also in secular terms, right? Mm. And, yes. and, and, and so I became interested in, you know, until the Second World War, um, the West defines itself as Christian, Aryan, white, European, Western, all these kind of racializing and religious categories, which are, you know, um, anti-Semitic in, in many, many ways, uh, both uh, against Muslims and Jews, who until this period are defined as Orientals. Mm -hmm. right? Orientals, both are defined as Semites. Uh, and so in, in the kind of racial and religious politics, 
uh, Jews and Muslims are seen as what uh, Anija calls the enemy of Europe, right? They've been constructed. And his argument, of course, is that Jews have been constructed as a theological enemy and Muslims as the political enemy, the Arab, the Arab as the political enemy of the West. And so I became interested in thinking through, okay, if this is uh, until the Second World War, this is how the West defines itself, uh, you know, Protestant, Christian, um, uh, uh, white, uh, uh, and, and also European, how does then in the war on terror, this designation of the West as Judeo-Christian become solidified and crystallized? And for me, an important point, of course, is the, the Second World War, uh, the Holocaust, uh, you know, this terrible genocide that takes place against uh, a, a European Jewish communities is a kind of culmination of the anti-Semitism that's directed against uh, Jewish peoples, uh, you know, by Europe, by the West. Um, and you know, I, I I look at the figure of the Muslim in in the in the in the Jewish camps. Uh, so the 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 you know the the camps inmates, the Jews who are on the verge of death, are called Muslim mm. by the other Jews in in the camps. So so I became really intrigued about why the Muslim, right? What is it about you know this figure of the Muslim that the the Jews who are in this really terrible, terrible genocidal conditions mm. still project those who are dying as Muslim. And it's not clear whether this term comes from the Jewish inmates or whether it comes from the German, you know, uh, guards of, mm. of, of, the, of, the, of the concentration camps, whether it comes from the Nazis or not. But for me, you know, I just began to think about why, why this term? What is the relationship here? And the argument I make, of course, is that after the Holocaust, European Jews get, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, assimilated. They get included in in Europe. They're, uh, you know, uh, redefined as as Westerners. Uh, they're uh, redefined as Europeans. And so I, I describe this as a process of Jews becoming white in the post Holocaust period. And you know, people have written about this. David Pierre Goldberg has written yeah. about. A number of people have, have looked at how Europe kind of washes its hands off the Holocaust and responsibility for the genocide by, you know, accepting Jews into whiteness and in the same moment helping establish the state of Israel. Uh, so I try and think through these politics of the Muslim in the camp, the establishment of the state of Israel at this particular moment, and the acceptance of Jewish peoples into whiteness. And I argue that this is the moment at which, for Jewish people, the projection of the Oriental is now fully onto the Arab, onto mm. the Muslim figure, as the Jews of Europe come to define themselves as also white. Uh, and then I kind of make a link to that process of, you know, uh, ejecting the Oriental from within, fixing that to the figure of the Muslim, to the figure of the Arab, who now is constructed as anti-Semitic, as, uh, you know, uh, uh, in many ways as, as uh, uh, completely anti-Jewish. Whereas previously both have been contained in the same category of the Oriental and the Semite. And so I make a link between the post Holocaust kind of emergence into whiteness of Jewish communities in Europe and the kind of establishment of Israel as a white colonial outpost because the ultimate kind of price of membership, if you want to say that, in the European project is to become the colonizer, right? Mm. And so we see the establishment of the state of Israel and I see that as a kind of consolidation of the whiteness of, 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 of Jewish people where you know Israel emerges as a settler colonial project and this moment is also really important because the Arab world, of course, is convulsed in revolution, anti, uh, anti-colonial movements, as is most of the third world at this time. And so one argument I make in the book is that the establishment of the state of Israel it, it is kind of also a phenomenon of uh, tremendous consequence for the third world project. 
because mm. it becomes a way of dividing, uh, you know, uh, the the kind of Middle East. Uh, it becomes a colonial outpost that is going to now be in the heart of the Muslim world, but it's going to be uh, affiliated with Europe. It's going to be supported by Europe, by the US, and it's basically a kind of white European project here that's you know, it's, it's also Jewish, but it is white and it's European and it's Western and it's colonial. And it destabilizes the third world project. And so I see the establishment of the state of Israel is also part of the move to counter the revolutionary movements that are emerging in the third world to break free of European domination. And itself emerges at the intersection of uh, European colonization, uh, the sykes pico agreement, uh, setting up uh, a buffer state to protect the Suez Canal yes. in order for all of the uh, uh, pillaging of India's treasures, $45 trillion uh, worth of uh, treasures from India are being funneled through the Indian Ocean to Red Sea and then Suez Canal. So all these are interconnected uh, elements that I thought you brought them uh, really together in a very uh, precise and uh, clear way. I also wanted to jump with you that you actually take on, at least introduce the discussion from Schmidt, Darida, and Andy Jar. I thought that was a wonderful discussion in there. And I want you just if you could expand on, on that conversation uh, that you take on these three. Uh, at least Andy Jar, I think you highlight some of his work but Schmidt and Darida in, in relations to Islam. Right, right. So, you know, um, these are really kind of interesting figures. Yeah. You know, Schmidt, uh, Derrida, and Anidja are all right about the kind of, uh, you know, the Europe's war with Islam during the Crusades as the moment at which Europe becomes political, right? that war is what until then it's a theological entity, it's a Christian entity, Christendom, but in it is with the war or with Islam that Europe becomes a political entity. And, you know, uh, so, so for me, it was really interesting to think about this because, you know, um, uh, Derrida and Anijar all, all kind of make the argument that war is what produces politics, right? And, mm -hmm. and Europe goes through this transformation. Uh, and that Islam is the enemy at this moment where politics emerges. So for me, it was really interesting that we have this argument being presented. Islam is referenced as the enemy par excellence that makes Europe become political. And yet what Islam is, or whether Islam treats religion and politics as separate categories is not something that interests them at all. And so they reference Islam, they reference the war with Islam, with Islam uh, as a, a kind of really important moment in Europe's self-constitution, but Islam itself is not something that they engage with. It just becomes the drop backdrop for Europe's kind of, you know, self-making that's the story that's well, it reminds me of uh urban the second speech the first part of the speech he's speaking about the conflicts within europe that we have limited land we're fighting against one another that's and then he switches to say we need to go on crusade to where the resources are at and then he couches it in a theological blanket yes so so for me you know where i take the argument is that you know they take Europe as an entity for granted, right? Mm -hmm. and, and for my reading of the kind of Crusades literature, what becomes really clear is that the Crusades are also Christianizing and producing Europe. Mm -hmm. that European, you know, I, uh, you know I'm, I'm kind of using the term Europe in brackets, is those who then constitute themselves as Christians later become Europeans. But the Crusades isn't Europe launching a war against Islam. The Crusades is also one particular Christian tradition mm -hmm. Christianizing its own kind of community base expanding across what will become Europe through this war on Islam. Mm -hmm. 
And so much of the literature takes, you know, Europe versus Islam as if two are independently formed entities that they are formed from their own kind of inner dynamics. And my reading of the Crusades literature was that what is happening here is that one particular Christian tradition is also becoming stronger, becoming more powerful and westernizing itself and westernizing by Christianizing the populations of this kind of pre-Europe into war with Islam. And so for me, that war with Islam and how Muslims are depicted becomes part of the DNA of this formation of Europe, right? So, yeah. so for me, Europe's culture, identity, its consciousness of itself continues from that moment of the Crusades to, as I said, the Reconquista, where mm -hmm. you know Muslims and Jews are expelled from Al-Andalus. And that leads to the creation of the modern state, right? So if we think about modernity and the modern state, the Reconquista is absolutely central to that. And it's the expulsion of Muslims and Jews that allows Europe in this sense to even become modern, right? And then of course, you know, I follow that through to see how these politics play out uh, and with colonialism. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, again, I go back to my argument that Islam is actually a structuring principle of this West, of this Europe, at all of the major moments of its transformation. And, you know, uh, I think that the war on terror laid it out so clearly that the task that was left was to try and think through, okay, what are the histories behind this? You know, why this particular language? Why this particular discourse of terrorism? Why this racial profiling of Muslims, right? Mm. Why this race and religion keep coming together, coming up together, mutually constitutive in different ways. Because of course, race is constructed differently now than it was in the 17th century. But yet, you know, race and religion continue to remain mutually constitutive if we want, I mean, and of course I'm using these categories, which are categories of modernity. Sure. One, one sees you can trace this historical trajectory back into early modernity and even kind of pre-modernity through tracking this relationship between Islam and quote unquote the West. And what's interesting again, if we look at uh, Huntington thesis, Clash of Civilization, uh, he lays it out on page 20 when he says that unless we hate uh, who we are not, we can't love ourselves, which in essence, again, focusing at the time on the uh, Chinese and Muslims as constituting the threats on the West. And then if you look at uh, uh, Steve Bannon's articulations and some of his speeches, focusing on the periods of the Crusades, as well as the uh, defense of Vienna and looking again at Muslims mm -hmm. as this arch enemy that we need to guard ourselves from. So yeah. you could see all that continuity up to the present uh, in, in public discourses. Yeah, so Islam is what has been constructed as the existential enemy, right? Yeah. Islam, even if we look at the enmity and the, the kind of uh, geopolitics at this particular moment where, you know, um, now that the war uh, in Afghanistan and Iraq, the US-led alliance hasn't been able to win any of these wars. But even now, in terms of if we look at the rivalry between um, the US and China, between the US and Russia, it is not expressed in existential terms. And it doesn't evoke the kinds of passion and the kind of hatreds that the, the, the kind of construction of Islam does in, in, in the, in the uh, Western imaginary. So Islam continues to be, and it has been for centuries now, how the West defines its existential enemy. And, and I think that's a really important point for Muslims to pay attention to, you know? Yeah. yeah. Uh, there's another area that I wanted to actually ask you to expand upon, because I thought it was really, it's an, it's uh, such a critical piece. Uh, you said that uh, 
it says the crisis set in motion across the Muslim world by the global war was soon enough uh, compounded by the crisis of whiteness within Western nation states. So maybe can you expand or talk about the link between the racialization of Muslims uh, and the rise uh, of white nationalists, white supremacists, and their emergence into uh, almost dominating the public square at this point, whether in the US, uh, there's aspects of it in Canada, definitely in France, uh, Netherlands, and other places. So this, uh, for me, this was a major, at least uh, observations that you had that you actually are making the linkage, which I think if you could expand on that piece. Um, yes, so what we have with the war on terror and immediately kind of following the, the attacks of 9-11 is the clash of civilizations thesis, where, the, where you know, the Bush administration, but, uh, you know, with, with support and collusion from all of the Western nation states at this moment, redefines the West in terms of cultural superiority, civilizational superiority. And, you know, so in the, so let me backtrack a, a, a bit. After the Second World War, we see a real shift in the racial politics of the West, right? Until then, we have white supremacist discourses which are mainstream. But after the Second World War, with many third world nations um, uh, uh, becoming independent, the discourse of race changes. We also have the civil rights movement, the immigrants' rights movement, all the anti-racist movements in the post-Second World War period fighting for the rights of racialized minorities. Uh, and so there is a shift in racial politics. We move to a kind of racial liberalism where multiculturalism becomes a framework. Uh, for you know the kind of uh, a responding to these anti-racist struggles and demands but also it becomes a project of kind of integrating racial minorities to a certain extent in the national projects of the west all of this is dealt a severe blow with the war on terror because now we have a kind of you know uh, we're back into the era of kind of white supremacy officially publicly sanctioned, quite acceptable, quite respectable. And we have these politics of racial tolerance now pushed into the background. Of course, you know, the idea of the West as being culturally and civilizationally superior, race at this particular moment is defined culturally. Right? Not by, and not, we don't have the biological kind of determinist uh, uh, definitions of race, but the West is considered culturally superior, mm -hmm. uh, egalitarian, liberal values, tolerance, against which Islam and, and Muslims are in, in the post 9-11 moment, defined as fanatic pre-medieval, uh, sort of medieval uh, pre-modern fanatics who cannot uh, uh, accept tolerance as a value of living in the modern world. So, you know, this is that kind of old white supremacist discourse, but it's now being articulated in the language of the Western superiority in cultural and civilizational terms. Uh, and for me, uh, you know, so, so there's a shift in the racial politics of the West with the loss, the losses of the war on terror, the US led alliance is not able to win in Afghanistan or Iraq or basically anywhere else that it has fought its proxy wars. Mm. Uh, what we see is uh, that discourse of cultural and civilizational superiority turning into white rage. That's my argument around mm. the, the emergence of white supremacy into the mainstream of US politics and across Europe and in Canada to a certain extent as well. And so we have that what is a kind of racialized discourse of Western cultural supremacy. And then with the defeats of the war on terror, we see this rage building. And of course, you know, the kind of questioning of Obama as a Muslim, as you know, the whole Bertha movement, that's what brings Trump to power. Uh, and so I see this, you know, the, the losses of the war on terror and also the kind of uh, the framing of the war itself as feeding this white nationalism, white rage, ideas about white supremacy, which have suddenly been granted sanction uh, 
by you know uh, mainstream republicans to some extent even by the democrats uh, and so you know to just to not see the continuities mm. between the, the bush administration's framing of the global war on terror the obama administration's framing of the global war on terror and the trump administration there is a continuity in their racial politics you know, on, on the one hand, you see the ultra right expression of white supremacy, but with the Obama administration, you know, we saw a kind of uh, the, the uh, racial liberal mm. expression of white supremacy, right? Obama is completely invested in the American dream, only in America this can happen. You know, he kind of furthers the drone wars. So he really deepens the kind of war on terror, takes it to a new level. Um, and so I, you know, in terms of the racial politics, they are, they remain continuous through all these U various US administrations. Trump, of course, you know, just kind of takes off any fig leaf around these racial politics. Um, but for me, it's it's actually the beginning of the war on terror that we see the sanction of this idea of white supremacy, uh, you know, uh, again, being kind of uh, quite unashamedly promoted by by mainstream political parties. And, and I thought that your uh, your observation that it is not the economic uh, uh, decline or lack of uh, economic well-being among the whites that's the driving force or at least the critical driving force because many observers say the fact that there's a loss of jobs in the industrial belt and so on i thought your your observation on that was really very uh, very critical at that uh, for, for the rise of this right uh, white supremacist white nationalist yes i mean i think the issue of the economic kind of decline and the economic deprivation is real and it's really serious but yeah. people of color are facing a much worse situation sure. economically right yeah. and so that for me isn't a convincing argument that it's it's white people who have been economically left behind is the argument uh, that's certainly true but so have other communities, communities of color, racialized peoples. And so for me, it's a fight between this kind of multicultural liberal discourse, which is also a racializing discourse and a white supremacist racial discourse. And that is the battle that we see being fought out in the, in the US um, at the moment and in, in parts of Europe as well. So it's not as if, you know, the white supremacists are the Trumpers and then there's no no kind of white supremacist with the with the democrats or you know that's a uh, you know i think it's it's a kind of question of degree yes. because, because you know uh, the 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 idea of the west the idea of the us as essentially a white nation remains really strong even in the liberal white imaginary uh I'm asking if, if people have questions, please, uh, you could drop your question on the chat and I'll make sure to include it in the conversation as we are uh, getting closer to our last 20 minutes. Uh, My chat says that it's disabled. One second, let me see. I'll try to get the chat up and running in a second. Hmm. Okay. Well, I'll try to fix that part in, in a minute. You actually point out in, uh, which is one of the things that I wanted to jump into, that the Muslims as being the photogenic object. Uh, what, what do you mean by that and how we do understand? And I think we're gonna maybe take a little bit of time to discuss sexuality as the third part because we discuss Islam, race and uh, sexuality. So if you could possibly maybe get us an understanding what is meant by this concept as it relates to the overall war on terror and the subjectivity of the Muslim subject. So, you know, I argue that the Muslim is transformed into uh, a, a hated object, right? Uh, 
in the war on terror. Uh, that, you know, there's a kind of fusion of fear, anxiety, hatred against this Muslim who refused to become civilized, right? Yeah. Who refused and, and, and to become civilized means to accept Western norms, Western values, Western practices. That is the kind of, uh, you know, marker of civilization uh, in, 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 in the kind of discourse of the West. And so there is a kind of, you know, uh, 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 the Muslim gets constructed as uh, fanatic, irrational, uh, as hating the West, right? Why do they hate us? This was the big kind of question uh, that, that Westerners kind of put to themselves. Uh, and, uh, but, but my argument is that the construction of the Muslim as this hate-filled figure actually incites hatred against Muslims. Because they hate us, it's fine to hate them back. Because they are fanatics, because they are violent, because they want to destroy the West, they want to destroy, quote unquote, our values, you know, then the use of violence against Muslims is acceptable and it can be legitimized. In fact, it's seen as absolutely necessary. So my argument here is the construction of Muslims as this phobogenic object allows the kind of legitimation of violence directed against Muslim communities wherever they are in the world. And we've seen in the West, you know, state violence against Muslims has increased, but so has vigilante violence. And so for me, you know, unpacking how the figure of the Muslim has been constructed in the war on terror in a way that legitimizes the violence that is done to Muslim communities, uh, uh, you know, and, and that's why I, I use the term phobogenic object, that this is an object that can be hated. And, you know, I think that here I'm really influenced by the work of Fanon, right? Mm. Because Fanon looks at the construction of blackness and how blackness in, in, in Europe's racial politics gets constructed as the kind of origin, the source of evil, uh, of, uh, you know, uh, uh, tremendous violence, and therefore the kind of colonial legitimation of youthful violence against the Algerians, against uh, colonized peoples everywhere. So I'm really influenced by Fanon's theories on violence, because, you know, uh, mm -hmm. is that so clearly how relevant they remain in, uh, in the early 21st century. So for me, Fanon's thinking around race, around race as violence, race is constructed through violence. And of course, Fanon defines a race as a project of dehumanization. Yes. Fanon says that racism transforms the black human being into an artifact of the white man. Right? And so, you know, one sees how that same kind of process and that same kind of violence is unleashed against Muslims uh, following 9-11. But, you know, I was really interested in thinking through this idea of hatred, because there is this fascination with the Muslim also that we see mm -hmm. in this moment, in this kind of post 9-11 moment, you know, the wanting to take off the hijab, wanting to see who is the real Muslim woman, right? So there is a kind of fixation and an obsession around mm -hmm. who Muslims are um, in, in this kind of hatred and violence that is expended against Muslims. And I wanted to track through, you know, do we see this historically as well? And of course, you see it historically, beginning from the moment of, you know, how the prophet is constructed, that there is this fixation, there is this obsession in which one sees hate, one also sees fear and anxiety, but mm -hmm. one also sees desire. And the desire is so, uh, you know, uh, for me, paying attention to that desire. Because when I looked at the kind of construction of Muslims during the Crusades, you can't, you know, you can't kind of miss the sexual tenor sure. of how Muslims are being constructed. And I think even in the global war on terror. Well, I, thinking about the torture regime in Abu Ghraib in Bagram right. and the whole sexualization of, of the whole uh, structure of torture that is really built upon an imaginary 
of what Muslim male sexuality is all about. That's right. So it's a sexual imaginary that I was really interested in tracking and see, you know, where does, of course, in the Orient, it's like, you know, it's everywhere, right? In the Orientalist mm -hmm. text and lots of post-colonial theorists have written about this. But you go back to the Crusades literature and you see the same sexual fascination there. Um, so for me, uh, you know, I then began to think about how Western sexuality itself has been constructed through the kind of Western construction of Muslim as this figure of horror, of absolute disgust, and yet of intense desire. Um, so I, I kind of track that desire, sexual desire also, uh, which kind of makes me also rethink the sexual politics of the, of the war on terror and how sexuality itself is be, be becoming transformed. Because of course that Muslims are, and uh, you know, Abu Ghraib gives mm. us a really kind of stark example of how Muslim sexuality is, is being viewed, Muslim male sexuality is being viewed. And the focus on the hijab tells us how Muslim women's sexuality is such a fixation. Um, uh, but the interesting you know, part is that during medieval Europe, the Western critique of Muslim uh, space is that it's sensual, yes. that it is a place of uh, in indulgement in desire, that their cities were filled with pleasures okay. opposite the... Christian world, and as it emerged, it developed this aspect of an imaginary of what it looks like. So this line of this sexual desire in the Muslim subject, male and female, is still there. Yes, it's there, and it's very strong during the colonial period as well, sure. right? When Muslims are seen through the lens of sexual excess, sexual degeneration, men and women, right? And, yeah. and the kind of colonial project becomes you know, training them into civilized sexuality, gaining access to the Muslim women. I mean, the Algerian, you know, uh, colonizers, you read the text, they're very explicit about this, right? In South Asia, you know, they want to save the Muslim, uh, the woman from, from, from uh, South Asian men, whether it's Hindu or Muslim, because they're depicted as, as terribly oppressed. Uh, sexually exploited. So throughout the whole colonial period, this is the discourse that we see that these communities are sexually deviant, sexually degenerate, sexually and culturally barbaric. And part of the civilizing mission of colonialism is to discipline them into, into heteronormativity, into heterosexuality. Um, and of course, now we see the tables have completely been turned where Muslims are constructed as sexually repressive, right? Mm -hmm. And the West is now, you know, uh, 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 being constructed as uh, sexually liberated and, and sexuality itself becomes a marker of the freedom of the West. Uh, so, you know, the war on terror marks a really interesting shift in the sexual politics and the gender politics as well of the West. And again, you know, I take the same approach. I look at the treatment of sexuality, the construction of Muslims as homophobic, as, you know, anti-gender anti sexual minorities, uh, uh, anti-woman, misogynist, patriarchal. And, and then I kind of trace it backwards through the colonial period, through the crusades, you know, what kind of constructs do we see there? And, and uh, you know, the idea of sexual deviance has been, mm -hmm onto Muslims, you know, either sexual excess or sexual repression, uh, you know, it kind of, that pattern keeps changing, but not the focus on sexuality, not the focus on the Muslim body, male and female, and, you know, how centrally this figures in how Christian women then write about themselves as being endangered by these Muslim invaders in Europe, right? Mm -hmm. what you see, and my argument here is that Western gender relations are actually shaped not only in relations between Western men and women, but in the bonding of Western men and women against the Muslim threat, right? Mm. Against the male hypersexualized Muslim male, against the sexually deviant Muslim woman who's going to corrupt Christian chastity. And so my argument here is that the, con the construction, the westernization of a particular Christian tradition's gender norms actually 
develops and unfolds in relation to the Muslim. Uh, and again, I, you know, that chapter on sexuality traces through at these particular moments and how that shifts. Um, and then, of course, you know, I rethink the, the gender politics as well, where I argue that, you know, the kind of uh, access that white women have to Muslims in the colonial context mm -hmm. through the politics of feminism, right? This is what allows them to travel to Algeria, to India, wherever, either as women writers, as teachers, as right. So, so you see how Western mm -hmm. women also get integrated into this project of disciplining Muslims. And we see that very clearly now with the war on terror, where you know West, Western feminists included yeah. are all kind of engaged in such concern over saving the Muslim woman. So, so I, I suppose the point of my book is that these constructs are centuries old. Mm -hmm. and the war on terror is the latest kind of, you know, manifestation of these long standing kind of uh, racial, religious, sexual, gender politics of Western self formation. And of course, through colonialism, they get globally institutionalized. Uh, and so for me, you know, the war on terror makes sense only when we look at it in terms of these very longer historical trajectories, because those politics, those relationships, those kind of, uh, you know, imaginaries of what Islam is, who the Muslim is, they continue to remain with us. And you know, there's this assumption that uh, uh, Islam was discovered in 9-11. That prior to this, there was no connections, disciplining, engagement yes. with the Muslim world. But we have a long history uh, from the Crusades to colonization. And interesting, uh, France just recognized the 1961 massacre of Algerians in the middle of Paris, uh, some 300 individuals. Yes. And then just uh, two years ago, returning. 24 uh, skulls of Algerians, uh, resistance fighters that the French took them to exhibit them in the Museum of Man. I guess uh, decapitated Algerians uh, taken to France. So this whole uh, almost amnesia about history and the uh, path that's been traveled around Islam, racialization of Islam, sexuality, um, otherization of the Muslim subject and interfering uh, both militarily, but intervention in the life and space of Muslims is an ongoing project. Yes, yes. And mm -hmm. I guess, you know, one, the, the kind of uh, the one argument that runs through the book, even though I don't go too much into it explicitly, is that, you know, Islam has evaded all these attempts by the West to capture it, to contain it, to mm. contain its plenitude. And Islam continues to be a force that has not been captured, right? That True. has not been contained, that has not been disciplined into Westernity, even if communities of Muslims have been, Islam has not been. And that it continues to point towards a horizon that is other then colonialism, coloniality, racial politics, it continues to you know, be a, a, a kind of signpost, if you will, to a, a way out of Westernity. And for me, what is really important is to underscore how Muslim communities might have been colonized. You know, they might have been incorporated into Westernity, what I call, you know, the, the mm -hmm. kind of Project of, the, of, of you know adopting Western gender sexual more norms, all of that. That's part of Westernity, but that Islam cannot be contained. It continues to evade, despite the kind of strongest efforts of all of the colonial powers. And they were very clear that they had to contain Islam if the colonial project was to succeed. And uh, you know, and 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 we see today with the war on terror as well the kind of you know arguments for moderate uh, articulations of islam which are you know more friendly to westernity and and 
uh, but you know, my my kind of uh, although I don't go into this very explicitly in this book, is that yeah. Islam continues to evade being disciplined into these projects of of uh, Westernity. I could take a, one or two questions because we're coming to the end of uh, the hour. So if you want to type your questions, uh, by all means, I could uh, uh, read it and uh, get your questions answered. Uh, maybe just for me as a way to conclude, uh, the link is up on top. Uh, it's on top of the chat, but I'll uh, make the link again in just a second. So you'll be able to order it uh, through Amazon. And I'm sorry that we have to go through Amazon, but it seems that uh, you know the only way for us to send Jeff Bezos to uh, our space and uh, is by us continuing to shop through his uh, portal. But I definitely encourage people to pick the book to recommend it. It's really uh, one so far. It's been reading through it. I've not finished it, but reading through it, it's. Uh, for any student of the contemporary period to understand and have a linkage between three important concepts, Islam, race, and sexuality, and its entanglement with the contemporary world, the war on terrorism, and to really look at these lines of, uh, you know, explorations and investigation, I highly recommend it. Uh, definitely would be recommended for uh, my students. So what's your recommendation for individuals who, uh, you know, engaging in research, graduate students, what line of inquiries would you recommend to them at this point? Uh, well, I mean, what I would recommend is to really, you know, that the context for the present is really important to study. How, how have we ended up where we are today, wherever we are? So these long histories that have produced the global order, um, is, is really important to understand, to pay attention to. And for me, when we're talking about religion, to historicize the category, not to fall into the trap of thinking that, uh, you know, uh, the idea of religion has always been there and it's just a kind of comparative way to look at different traditions. This was part of the colonial project, right? And one point I make in, my, in the book is that defining Islam as a religion is a colonizing move, right? And mm -hmm. so I, I, I kind of locate the moments at which we see the evidence of this, right? Uh, so, so really, uh, you know, going to these categories and really trying to understand where they, where they come from and what work do they do in the moment that these categories come into being? Who brings them into being? This becomes really important because you know these are kind of these categories encode power and they encode relations of violence. Uh, so, so for researchers, students, I think really questioning the categories and concepts that we use without taking them as kind of self-evidently being what they are locating them within the field of power. This becomes really important. And then I think, you know, for me, the biggest thing is, you know, which perspectives, which voices, which experiences are we going to learn from and center in our work? Mm -hmm. Are these the perspectives and historical experiences and struggles of dispossessed and disempowered people? Or are the perspectives of ruling elites the ones that we're going to accept? Uh, you know, the war on terror was a very clear moment <laughs> in mm -hmm. terms of who was defining this ideology, where this Islamic discourse was coming from, and yet that Islamophobic discourse got picked up even by Muslims themselves. Mm -hmm. So for me, remembering you know, that the experience, the perspectives, the discourses, the struggles of disempowered and disenfranchised people is, a, is a also a kind of centuries long resistance. And it's grounding and learning to recognize that tradition. And one argument I make is that the figure of the Muslim today stands in for what Fanon called the wretched of the earth in his mm -hmm. work. And yet, because the figure of the resisting Muslim has been constructed as a terrorist, right? This history, the tradition of the wretched of the earth 
is not something that is the lens through which we view Muslims who are fighting Westernity in, in many ways, whether it's you know through queer politics, whether it's through feminist politics, but so so you know, really which perspectives will we learn from? And not to forget the histories of resistance that come before this moment, right? Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, the the if 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 the West has managed to exert its power globally, the resistance against it has also been centuries long. And yet we're not taught to respect that history, to learn from it, to understand it even. And for me, that becomes really important. And thank you. And uh, this conversation has been enriching. Uh, Professor Sunaira Kobani, it's great for you to be with us. Again, I uh, recommend the book. And if you pick it up, you have such a rich bibliography. So for anyone that is going to be doing research, uh, the bibliography for me is something that uh, stands as a testimony to the richness of the resources that you have uh, used. Fanan, Talal Asad, Joseph Masad, Derrida, Edward Said, Salman Sayed, and a whole host of others. Uh, so really thank you for being with us yeah. and uh, look forward to continued encounter. I will be reading it far more in detail and expect more questions and discussions. And I will recommend it for all my students. Thank you. Thank you very much for organizing this. Thank you to everybody who has been here to you know, participate in this event. Thank you so much. I am so grateful to you. And for the audience, recommend this book. I always, when I travel and I visit bookstores, there's a lot of nonsense that are on the bookshelves about Islam and Muslims and so on. I would say it's an insult to some, put some of those books in the recycling bin. I think the recycling bin will say I have, I have principles, but this book really recommend it. It's a good reading and for people who have book clubs, uh, make sure to, to include it in your book club uh, monthly reading or weekly reading. So thank you and uh, wish you all the best. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam.